put in a lot of extra special work on that. <coughs> Good job. Seen you here since you've been out, isn't it? No? One other time? Yeah. I was thinking maybe I, this was my first time. We can see you. Okay. Resurrection Sunday. Every Sunday. Every day. We should be thinking about the resurrection. So this morning we're going to be continuing our study in the book of the Revelation. Uh, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 1, verses 6 through 16 today. So if you want to turn to Revelation chapter 1 and uh, go to verse 6, you'll be ready to follow along with me in a few moments as I read. If you don't have your Bible, you can follow the screen. Revelation chapter 1. We'll begin in a moment with verse 6. This is Resurrection Sunday, and uh, this uh, message today will not start off like anything connected with the resurrection, but when we get to verses 12 through 16, we're going to see that... Uh, we're dealing with the resurrected Christ there. And uh, it dawned on me the other day when I was uh, working on this that John has this encounter with the risen Christ. Okay, He has an encounter uh, with Christ that is the freshest uh, encounter or the freshest uh, uh, description of an appearance about Jesus that we have, okay? Uh, of course, John knew him when he was on earth. Uh, John was one of the, the disciples. And uh, now we have this description that John uh, gives concerning him. And uh, the interesting thing that dawned on me was the fact that this is 60 years, give or take a year or two, uh, after the resurrection. So John is having this encounter with Jesus some 60 years after the resurrection. And uh, I, I just think that is uh, such a neat thought that, uh, that it would be that many years will have gone by and John is still alive. <clears throat> and John is able to have this encounter uh, with, with one that he knew so well and now to see him as he is seen, as, as he appears, uh, in, in heaven. So let's uh, begin this and we'll get to that uh, Easter part of it at verse 12. So bear with me uh, getting there. Verse 6. John writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and he says, and he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. John begins here by pointing out the fact that Jesus has made believers to be a kingdom. Notice the order here. Verse 5, where we closed last week, we learned that Jesus released us from our sins by His blood. Now we have uh, the information that those who have been released from their sins by Jesus' blood now become members of a kingdom. So those who have recognized their sin, turn from their sin, and place faith and trust in Jesus, now they constitute or make up the kingdom of God. Okay? Now, John goes on to tell us that as members of the kingdom of God, we each one become a priest to God. And that's an interesting thought. Each one of us, as Christians, become a priest to God. Now, <clears throat> the work that a priest does is to mediate. So a priest then speaks to God on behalf of men, and to men on behalf of God. As priests, 
Believers are to pray to God for the world and witness to God to the word uh, to the world what God has done to save them from their sins. Because we as priests are that mediator, that go-between between God and man. Now he goes on and says that there's glory and dominion that belong to Christ forever and ever because of all uh, uh, that He has done for us to remove our sins and making us priests. So this, all the praise and the glory and the honor that we could ever give God is, is due Him if it was for no other reason other than what has happened right here uh, in the fact that He redeemed us by His blood from our sins. And then He made us uh, a kingdom of priests. And uh, we will spend eternity realizing more and more what it means for the fact that we have been made uh, priests unto God in a kingdom of priests. Uh, because eternity uh, will unveil all that that will mean uh, to us in our lives. Now verse 7. He says, Behold, He is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn over Him. So it is to be. Amen. This verse makes it clear that the risen Christ is coming back to planet earth. When He returns, John says, Every eye will see Him. And then he specifically points out those who pierced him. That's an interesting thought. Those who drove the nails in Jesus' hands and his feet. The one that put the crown of thorns on his head. The one that, that uh, stabbed him in the side with the sword or the spear. Those people will see Jesus when he returns. And it's important for us to realize <clears throat> that the return of Christ, the second coming of Christ, has two phases. Okay? It's important to understand them. The first phase is the rapture of the church. That's when Jesus comes in the clouds and He raptures up, He catches up all the born-again Christians into heaven to be with Him. Then the seven-year tribulation takes place here on earth. And then at the end of that seven years, we get to the part that John is talking about here. Because Jesus will not come down to earth in the first phase, the rapture. And Jesus will not be seen by the world in the first phase, which is the rapture. But the part that John is speaking of here in this verse is referring to the second phase of the second coming. So there's not more than one coming of Christ. There's only His first coming when He came and He died on the cross, was raised to life, went back to heaven. His second coming will just simply have two phases of it. The first phase at the beginning uh, when the church is raptured, at the beginning of the tribulation, and then the second phase at the end of the tribulation. Now, what's going to happen in that second phase, uh, there's a lot of things, but one main thing that is connected with what we're looking at here is the fact that there's going to be the tribes of the earth will mourn over Him. They will all see Him. Uh, and it's because they rejected Him as their Savior and therefore they're eternally lost. <clears throat> they see Him. <clears throat> they see His majesty, His glory. They see who He is. The world sees Him. Everyone sees Him. And there's no longer a question about who He is. And in their case, they have rejected Him as their Savior. And because of that, they're eternally lost. And they will mourn and they will grieve in His presence because of that. And this is something that's really important for us to keep in mind and, and, to, and to realize that a person must accept Jesus as their Savior now. 
because we have no uh, <clears throat> promise of tomorrow. The first phase of the second coming could happen this afternoon. And the moment Jesus steps out on the clouds of glory to call His church up, it's over. Only those who will have already been saved can go to heaven. The rest will be left behind. And will go into the tribulation period. And I personally believe that the Scripture teaches us that those who had a full knowledge of the Gospel and turned their back on it, and then Jesus comes and raptures the church, I believe they will be deceived and not able to be saved when they go into the tribulation. The only people I believe that will be saved during that beginning part of the tribulation, and there will be many that will be saved then, will be those who have not had an opportunity to hear the gospel clearly now and accept it or reject it. So this is a serious, serious matter. And if a person is not right with Christ right now, you may never be right with Christ. Because if the rapture comes, you're left behind. And if truly what I'm believing from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is right, you will not get an opportunity to be saved. Why would you not get an opportunity to be saved? Because you're hearing the gospel in a clear presentation right now. It's being presented to you right now. If you have not accepted Christ, you need to accept what He's done for you. And if you reject it, you're playing Russian roulette with eternity, your eternal soul. And that's the truth uh, of Scripture. And so, uh, Jesus could come at any moment, or we could die at any moment. And either one of those situations would put a person without Christ lost in eternity. And it could put a person in a situation where they're still walking and breathing on the face of this earth and no possible way to be saved. Because I think that's the condition that many will be in in that first part of the tribulation period. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> verse 8. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This verse clearly refers to God. Alpha and Omega are the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. And uh, what this is simply saying here is, is that God is the beginning and He is the ending. His eternal nature is expressed here when it says that He is the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come. So that covers everything. He's, he's the eternal God. The one who is, who was, and who is to come. And so we see that uh, presented concerning God and who He is uh, in that manner. Now John goes on and says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. <clears throat> Here John expresses great humility as he calls himself a, a fellow brethren and a, a brethren and fellow partaker that he presents these things that he's a partaker of here. He totally disregards the fact that he is the oldest living apostle. John, at this point, is the last person that we know of that was alive, that knew Je that saw Jesus face to face, that one, one of his disciples, okay? So he's the oldest living apostle, and he was considered uh, the most revered saint on earth in his day by the church at that time. Yet, he, he totally ignores all of that, and he aligns himself with the people. Now, just a few short years after that, 
people begin to do the opposite of what John did here. Instead of putting themselves on the level with everyone else as a Christian, they moved into the time in which the church began to elevate certain people high above others in the church. And then you had uh, come into the, the church, the whole uh, papal system, all the, the things about the Pope and uh, him being so much greater than everyone else and, and, and all of those things. But John here was the, the most uh, uh, phenomenal Christian, shall we say, alive at that moment that was receiving this special revelation from Jesus. And John just says, I'm a fellow partaker with the rest of you. And uh, such humility here, uh, it, it, it we see, and it's, and it's worthy of praise, uh, his humility is. Now, he was a fellow partaker of other believers in three ways. First, in tribulation. Now, this refers to the fact that he was suffering as a believer. Okay? He had been banished uh, as a believer to the Isle of Patmos. Okay? And that was a suffering that he was facing tribulation. But this is not talking about the great tribulation uh, that we'll be talking about in the seven-year tribulation. It would be tribulation that he was facing like suffering that other people uh, would face as Christians at that time. Soon after that, the, the, tr the tribulation uh, to the degree of what we know, uh, tribulation in the, in the period of the seven-year tribulation to be. Now, in the kingdom is the second way, he says. In other words, he was a member of the kingdom along with other believers. And he was not seeking to put himself up higher than anyone else. And then in perseverance, this refers to an active, manly endurance in suffering rather than a negative resignation. Um, this is something that we should think about as we face suffering in our own Christian lives at different times. Are we going to just uh, lay down and take it and just be resigned to the fact that I'm a Christian? And because I'm a Christian, I'm going to have times in which I face suffering? Or are we going to stand up to it and, uh, and, and fight back uh, in the name of Jesus with the weapons of, of warfare that we have? <clears throat> now, that's something that each one of us will have to settle for ourselves as to how we deal with that. But it's clear that John is on the Isle of, island of Patmos. And he says he's there because of the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. And what that's simply saying is this. <clears throat> John is there because he was preaching the Gospel. Because he was preaching the truth. <clears throat> he was banished uh, to this island as uh, <clears throat> to shut him up and, and as punishment. <clears throat> now verse 10. He says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. <clears throat> in the Spirit means that he was under the influence of the Holy Spirit. On the Lord's day refers to the first day of the week, Saturday, the first day of the week, the Lord's day. This was the day that the, that the uh, Jesus was resurrected and it was the day that the early church chose to worship on. Okay? Uh, for some time they worshiped on the Sabbath when there was still confusion really between uh, the Jews and the Gentile believers. And uh, until all of that was sort of settled out, they, they worshiped uh, part of that time with the Jews on Saturday. But it came a point in time in which they took uh, the, the, the uh, Sabbath day, not the Sabbath day, but the first day of the week, which was uh, Sunday. And uh, of course, the seventh day of the week was uh, Saturday, the, the Sabbath, the day that the, the Jewish population <coughs> worshipped. So they took that day uh, to worship because it was the day that Jesus 
had been resurrected. And uh, so he's in the spirit on that day. <clears throat> in some fashion, he's worshiping Jesus on that day, the first day of the week, on Sunday. And as he is in the spirit and under the influence of the spirit uh, in this manner, he hears this voice. And the voice he describes it was like a loud trumpet. <clears throat> and uh, what he's basically saying here is it, it, was, it sounded like a loud trumpet. But it wasn't a trumpet. And that's the best way he can describe uh, the voice that he heard. And uh, we can say some more about that in, in just a minute. But uh, hold that thought right now. This uh, loud voice like a trumpet. Now, what was it saying? Verse 11. It said, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches. To Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now, <clears throat> the voice instructed John to write. Now literally, that was right in a scroll, because that would be uh, the word uh, in the Greek, and the, the thought, but it would be a book to us. And after he's written in it what he sees, he's supposed to send it to each one of these churches. And we talked earlier about the fact that these were seven literal existing churches in John's day. Oh, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> but at the same time, we see that they represent in church history seven different periods of the church. Each church and its condition in that day is the condition that that period of church history uh, will be related to later. Just like the last two, uh, <clears throat> Philadelphia and Laodicea, they represent the church at the time that we live in now. One is a true church made up of born-again believers. That's the Philadelphia church. The second is the Laodicea church, and it is the false church. It is the church that looks like church, calls itself church, calls itself Christian, but it's not made up of born-again Christians. It's made up of a group of people that have Christianity as their religion. And I am not a religious person. And I don't refer to myself as religious. Because referring to yourself as a Christian, as religious, is not a good thing. If you really understand what we're talking about in return. Because these people in the Laodicean church are religious. But they are the people that are not right with God. And so, you see in the, those last two churches, you see those two churches. There was a Philadelphia church that when we get into the churches, they're going to be praised by Jesus. And He's going to say, when the tribulation comes, you will not be harmed, basically. All the rest of the churches, He's going to find something wrong with them. Okay? And He's going to give them warning. Get this right or else. So, the Philadelphia church existed then as a literal church, just like the others. It exists now but it exists now in the spirit realm in terms it is all of those who are Christians that are truly born again. So it's representing that group. And the lay of the sin is representing all of those that claim to be Christian but are not. And, uh, and it's, it's interesting as this will unfold as we go further and further <clears throat> into the revelation that these people uh, at some time in the future will be the church that will unite with the Antichrist and actually uh, <clears throat> persecute and take the life of Christians, of people who become believers in the first part of the tribulation. Which is a, a wild thought, but it's the truth of what the revelation uh, is teaching and we will see all of that unfold <clears throat> as we move further uh, in our study. Now, verse 12. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. 
And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. John turned to see the voice that was speaking. And when he turned, he saw seven golden lampstands. <clears throat> now, the last part of Revelation chapter 1, verse 20, tells us exactly what the seven golden lampstands are. They are the seven churches. <clears throat> so this is important. <clears throat> we spoke of one of the ways that uh, people see as a valid way to interpret the Revelation is to look at all of it symbolically. And that's the way some people look at it <clears throat> and interpret it. And so they would look at this in this way and uh, something similar to this and they would try to get uh, <clears throat> more of some symbolic understanding about this. Where it's right here, clear as crystal. You don't have to figure out some symbolic meaning of what the word is saying here. All you got to do is read it. It says that the seven uh, lampstands are the seven churches. <laughs> That's not rocket science. And so much of the revelation is just that way. People get all kinds of things in their mind and their heads in terms of trying to understand and explain it when if they would just calm down and let that speak for itself a lot of it would be made clear uh, there's a saying that the best commentary on scripture is scripture yeah. and that is a very very true saying and so here's a good example <clears throat> no big thing for us to scratch our heads and try to figure out what is he saying here he's saying clearly he turned around saw seven lampstands and those seven lampstands are the seven churches <clears throat> now this is a fitting symbol for the church because Matthew 5 14 there Jesus told his disciples you are the light of the world <clears throat> so Talking about the churches as, as something to do with light is a fitting thing. Christians are to be light in the darkness of sin uh, in the world around us. As believers, we are to yield ourselves to Christ and <clears throat> allow Him to live through and therefore shine His light <clears throat> through us to those around us. <clears throat> and the brilliance or the brightness of our light will be dependent upon this. It will be determined by our yieldedness to Jesus. The brightness or lack of brightness of your light and my light as believers is going to be determined by our yieldedness to Jesus because He's the source of the light. So we will only have light flowing out of us to the degree that He fills us through the Holy Spirit. So we see then that the church is seen here as seven lampstands. They, they, are, they are representing the church and the light that's to go forth from the church. And of course the church is made up of the true believers. Now verse 13. And in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest <clears throat> with a golden sash. John saw one like a son of man in the middle of the lampstands. Now this is clearly a reference to Jesus. Mm -hmm. The term or the title son of man is a title that is used to refer to Jesus. Jesus refers to himself, <coughs> excuse me, with that title. And it is used to refer to the Messiah in all four Gospels as well as in the book of Daniel. The robe that he has on is typical of one that would have been worn by the high priest who ministered in the holy place in the temple. <coughs> Now keep in mind the fact that in Hebrews, Jesus is referred to as our high priest. So this would be similar to the garment of a high priest being worn in that day. 
Uh, Jesus' robe was girded across the chest with a golden sash. Now, only those in authority would have worn such a garment with a golden sash like this in Jesus' day. And this is also revealing something to us. Uh, Matthew 28, 18 shows us that all power and authority has been given unto Jesus. <clears throat> all power and authority. So he's simply by his dress here, what he has on. Uh, it's depicting the fact that he has all of this power and authority. And so these are things that, that uh, are not strange and something uh, far off out there. It's something that we can easily understand and realize and, and see about Jesus. <clears throat> now verse 14. And his head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. Jesus' head and hair are compared here to white wool and snow. His eyes, John said, are like a flame of fire. Now, <clears throat> literally in the Greek, it is his eyes shot fire. His eyes <clears throat> shot fire. And that's not something <clears throat> all that bizarre. <clears throat> We talk about people having a twinkle in their eye. Uh, we talk about, uh, you know, seeing and understanding things about people as to whether their eyes were bright, uh, you know, indicating they may feel good or, or, or whatever, or some way that their eyes are, are dull and what's wrong with you or whatever. So that's not a, a far-fetched thing to think about what he's trying to say here about his eyes. And... <clears throat> It may be that he's trying to, with this uh, thought of the shooting forth of fire, may have something to do with Jesus' indignation <clears throat> with the church, the seven churches that he's writing the letters to at the time that they were written. And so, if you can imagine, here's the first century church. Well, clearly, six of those seven churches have problems. <clears throat> and Jesus wanted those problems straightened out. But can you imagine looking at the problems of the six of those seven churches that Jesus saw in that day and Him being indignant against their condition? Can you imagine what Jesus would be thinking or the flame that would be shooting forth from His eyes as he looks at the church today. <clears throat> Revelation 3.16 reveals Jesus' attitude toward the lukewarmness of the Laodicean apostate church of the first century as well as our day. Remember I said earlier that the Laodicean church is representative of a church that claims to be something, but it's not. The world looks at it and says, wow, what an impressive church. But Jesus looks at it and his eyes shoot fire. This is what he says about it. He says, so because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now literally in the Greek it says, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That is Jesus' attitude <clears throat> as he looks at that lay of this in the church in that day. But we have to keep in mind the fact <clears throat> that that church, that there's a part of the church, the body of Christ, or called the body of Christ, claiming to be the body of Christ. There's a part of that church that claims to be the body of Christ today that falls under the, the umbrella of the stage or the category of the Laodicean church. 
the lukewarm church of the end time. And, uh, and we have to realize that Jesus looks at that church and he says, they are, he's so repulsed by them that he would vomit them out of his mouth. It's a strong, strong, strong statement. <clears throat> and Jesus would not say that about those that were his children those that were true Christians. He might be upset at things that they were doing or not doing, but he would work with them to seek to bring them to do and act the way he wanted them to do. He wouldn't, um, he wouldn't have this attitude of basically, you know, I'm finished, just spit you out. <coughs> now verse 15 says his feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. <clears throat> his feet being compared to burnished bronze as it makes a, it makes a glow uh, in the furnace. And it speaks of judgment. It reminds us of the altar uh, in the Old Testament <clears throat> where uh, sacrifices were, were burned and were laid and where judgment was, was coming in a situation like that. And that may be some of what the image is in this situation. Uh, <clears throat> we need to realize that Jesus gave His life on Calvary's cross to save mankind from sin. But all who reject His plan of salvation will spend eternity in the lake of fire being punished for their sins. <clears throat> so he's talking here about something that would be similar in the Old Testament then, like, like that, that altar where sacrifices would be being burned. And, and <clears throat> the heat would bring things, the, the implements and all, to a certain uh, color in its glow. And so he's comparing this. And what we see in the, in the comparing of this is here again, something that Jesus uh, would not be pleased with, uh, that he sees that he's not pleased with. Now, <clears throat> John writes that his, and it's referring to Jesus, his voice was like the sound of many waters. Now, <clears throat> it's, in, <clears throat> excuse me, it's interesting that in Ezekiel 43, Ezekiel shares a vision of the future, something yet future to us, when the Messiah returns to earth, and that would be when Jesus comes down at the end of the seven year tribulation, what we talked about earlier. When he comes down to earth, <clears throat> he is going to go uh, to the temple, and he will enter the temple by way of the eastern gate. And Ezekiel has this vision <clears throat> of seeing this happen. And notice what he says. Ezekiel writes this in Ezekiel 43. His voice was like the sound of many waters. The exact same statement that John gives here concerning the sound as he describes uh, <clears throat> in this picturesque way uh, uh, Jesus' voice. But Ezekiel goes on and writes, And the earth shone with his glory. Now remember, this is, this is yet future. This is when Jesus comes down at the end of the tribulation. Okay? And, and He begins to, to rule and to reign uh, on earth. And, and the thousand year uh, kingdom comes into play. <clears throat> and He goes on here, uh, Ezekiel writes, Son of man, this is the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell among the Jews among the sons of Israel forever. Now, <clears throat> this is something that is important as we think about events that are going to take place in the future. This is an event that's going to take place in the future. And so Jesus is coming to rapture His true church. And <clears throat> after the church is raptured, then that will usher in the seven-year tribulation the Antichrist will come on the scene. And all of the events that happen in the Revelation after chapter 4 will begin to unfold on the earth. 
And, <clears throat> and so this will be after all that happens at the end of the seven years. Then uh, Jesus is going to come back and that will be the second phase of his second coming. He will come back. And when he comes back, <clears throat> he will uh, have an, uh, an effect upon the remnant of Israel to such a degree that they recognize him as the Messiah. And Israel as a nation then accepts Jesus as their Messiah. It will be that small remnant, but that will be the time in which the Scripture talks about all Israel uh, accepting the Messiah. And that's the time that that will happen. And it's an event that will happen. And we know when it will happen. It will happen right at the end of the seven-year tribulation, just prior to Jesus uh, beginning the thousand-year reign uh, here on earth. <clears throat> so, uh, does Jesus have a plan in the future for the, for the Jews? Yes, he does. Right now, his plan and his desire would be that each individual Jewish person <clears throat> would recognize him as the Messiah and accept him as their Lord and Savior. <clears throat> but he would also uh, <clears throat> uh, is looking forward to that time in which the whole nation of Israel, that portion that's the remnant, He's looking forward to that time when they recognize him. And then uh, <clears throat> all of his promises then that have been given in the Old Testament uh, and he promises in the New Testament, all the promises that Jesus has given the Jewish people that has not yet been fulfilled, they will, each one of them, be fulfilled. But the group of the Jews that will receive those promises unfortunately will be that small remnant that will be saved at the end. <clears throat> but uh, he will be able to completely fulfill all his promises at that time. So we have to believe that there is a plan for the Jews as individuals and as a nation still out there uh, in God's mind and heart. Because if there wasn't, then that would mean the Bible is not true. Because there would be promises made in the Bible to the Jewish people as a nation that will have not been fulfilled. So it's got to happen. Because if it doesn't happen, none of us have anything. Because I'm telling you today, every hope that I have for anything rests in the fact that the Bible is the truth and the Word of God. If I don't have that, I don't have anything. You can give me all the wealth in the world, you can give me all the fame in the world. You can give me all the pleasure in the world. You can give me whatever this world offers. And it will be worthless to me if it's not what Jesus has and the promises he has to his children in the world. And <clears throat> I believe that we are... <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, a lot of the medication I'm taking for my back is causing this dry mouth, and I apologize. I can't do anything about it. Uh, but I believe that a lot of the things that are happening right now in the world, I believe that that uh, many Christians are falling under. Uh, times of great trial and test and what we might even call 
in, in some would call tribulation, not tribulation of the tribulation period, but certainly trial and test. And, uh, and uh, I believe that that's happening simply because we're getting closer to the end. <clears throat> and uh, how does a football team prepare to win the Super Bowl or whatever. Practice. The closer they get, they practice, they work, they practice, they work. Uh, they, they do the same drills, they make their muscles, their body do the same thing over and over and over and over again <clears throat> until it becomes a natural function. And when the time comes, their bodies work and do the things that makes them capable of winning. Well, as Christians, <clears throat> God strengthens us with trials and tests and difficulties. And the more severe the trials and the tests and the difficulties are, that's indicative of the higher level of maturity and discipline we have been brought to as a Christian. <coughs> so if God's going to prepare us for even more, <clears throat> then He's going to have to put more on us. And we have to get stretched with that. And when we learn and grow under that situation, then He has to put more on us. And that's the way it works. And <clears throat> I believe that there are Christians right now that are probably feeling like that they have never faced trials as severe as what they're facing right now. And I'm saying that they may be Christians that you could look at and you would not see anything so great coming against them, maybe. Yet within, there's a battle that is maybe greater than they've ever known. And, it, and it's all, I believe, because we're getting closer to the end. And we've got to be trained. We've got to be prepared. Uh, we've got to be uh, made ready to stand more so that we can be what we need to be right up until the point that Jesus comes and takes us out. And um, that's not the kind of sermon or the kind of words from a preacher that's going to fill the house. A lot of the people would say, wait, I don't want to hear that anymore. <laughs> I want to hear that guy down the street that says, God's going to give me all the money I want. He's going to give me all the, the cars and houses and boats and, and uh, motorcycles and, 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 uh, and uh, friends and, and leisure and party and travel. I want, I want that God. And the truth is, the people are flying to that God. They're beating the doors down to the buildings where that God is being proclaimed. And it's and, and that is to pinpoint for you right there. That's your Laodicean church of today. Hear what they're preaching. And you're going to know the Philadelphia church from the Laodicean church that is in our midst right now. Let's close with verse 16. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. <clears throat> Here John reveals Jesus holding in his right hand seven stars. Now verse 20 of verse 1, 
tells us that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The meaning of the Greek word translated angel is literally messengers. So angel or angels are used here most likely to refer to the messenger divinely appointed by God to lead the local congregation. And here he's referring to the seven churches. For example, the spirit leader or pastor at the church of Ephesus in Revelation 2.1 was referred to as the angel of the church at Ephesus or in Ephesus. Thus, the meaning of angel here most likely refers to the pastor of a church in that day as well as our day. And this shows us uh, how that we should realize the great responsibility that's placed on each pastor to speak for God to the people in his congregation. Remember I said before, this job of priest was a mediator between God and man and man and God. <clears throat> well, there needs to be then <clears throat> this responsibility that's uh, carried out to the fullest so that, that the congregation can hear what God wants them to hear. Now, out of Jesus' mouth came a sharp, two-edged sword. <clears throat> Ephesians 6 and Hebrews 4 uh, reveals the meaning of this sword. <clears throat> and it's not something that you're going to see Jesus with this sword coming out of his mouth like he has this big long tongue that's a sword. That's not what's being shown here. What's being revealed here is that from his mouth comes the Word of God. Because in the Scripture, in Ephesians and in Hebrews, we clearly see that the sword is the Word of God. <clears throat> so he's talking here about the Word of God coming out of the mouth of Jesus. <clears throat> so that which proceeds out of the mouth of the pastor teacher of the local congregation must be the same that proceeds out of the mouth of Jesus. What is that? The Word of God. The Word of God. And only the Word of God. John saw Jesus' face shining like the sun shining in its strength. Now this reminds us of Matthew 17, 2 and the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus' face was shining like the sun. There God spoke out of the cloud and proclaimed Jesus as His beloved Son and the one that we must listen to. We must listen to Jesus and we must obey what He has to say. Those who do will be saved from the wrath that is to come. Those who do not heed the teachings of the Word of God, the, the teachings of Jesus, the, the words that come forth from His mouth, the words that come forth from those He has chosen to speak His Word uh, to the world, if they do not heed those words, then those people will face judgment. And they will spend eternity, now listen to this, in the place that is called the second death, the lake of fire. And they will spend that forever and forever. Why will they go there? Because they sin? That's not the reason totally. Because every one of us has sinned. Everyone that goes to heaven will have been a sinner. Except maybe small babies, yes. Little babies that are not, are not accountable for their actions. Do you understand what I'm saying? That, that, uh, that we must listen to the words that come forth from Jesus. We must listen and act on the words of this book. 
If we do, we have a good future. If we don't, then what is left is the lake of fire. And, uh, and that's an eternal place of judgment and damnation where people will be punished for their sins because they didn't let Jesus forgive them for their sins. He's saying, I, I want to wipe it clean. I've already paid the price for every one of your sins. I died on the cross. That covered me. I'm alive to make my promise sure. But the point is, we individually have to respond. And we either accept Christ and go to heaven or we reject Christ and go to the lake of fire. Now, that's, that's the word here that's coming forth on this Easter Sunday morning from the resurrected Christ. And, you know, there are a lot of people that would say, well, you should have preached another sermon for Easter. This is the next sermon in line. The next passage in line is why I, I preached it. I didn't skip over something to preach this. But to me, this is a valid Resurrection Sunday message. Because it tells us that it's all there available to us. But we've got to do something ourselves to reach out and take it. And 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 apply it to our life. We have to personally accept Jesus Christ. Uh, if we're going to be benefited by his death on the cross and his resurrection. Now, as we near closing, and I'll only have just a couple minutes more, I want us to uh, turn our attention uh, to sharing the Lord's Supper together. And uh, let me tell you how we're going to do this. Mike has a little cup in front of you. And uh, it has a little flap on it. And you, in a moment, if you will take off that little flap and get a little piece of bread there, then you will have the bread for the supper. And then after that, at the appropriate time, you can peel the other part off. And you will then have uh, the cup for the Lord's Supper. You're okay. a rocket scientist. <laughs> so, yeah. so, this is a very serious moment, okay? Me too. Very serious moment. So, let me say that if you're here and you have accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, then you are worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. But if you've not accepted Jesus as your Savior and Lord, I must, with the strongest words I could possibly speak, say to you, do not take the Lord's Supper. And if you want to know the reason for that, just read the last of 1 Corinthians 11 that I'll be reading from in a moment. Read those last verses in that chapter and you will understand that there is great danger in taking the Lord's Supper if you're not born again. And so I'm not going to just throw it out there and just say, come and get it like a lot of people do. I'm going to tell you, if you're saved, take it. Be blessed by it. If you're not, we're going to give you an opportunity to get saved in a minute. But if you're not saved, don't take this Lord's Supper. Okay? Now I want us to take a moment just to prepare our hearts uh, to receive the bread and the cup. And uh, then we will do that.
In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 24, Paul writes this. He said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had, uh, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The body of Christ. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The blood of Christ. Notice that that verse ends with, when we do this, we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. He's got to be resurrected to come. So you have the essence of it right here, of the resurrection. He had to die. He was buried. Then He had to be raised again. And because He has been raised again, forgive us of our sins and he's going to come again so if you're here this morning and you have never accepted Christ as Savior and Lord I encourage you to do that if you need as a Christian to recommit your life to Christ I encourage you to do that or if you have any prayer need whatever it might be I encourage you to be prayed for our ministry team will be to my right your left of the room as soon as I dismiss Go back and let them pray with you and counsel with you. Our offering bucket is to the left of the doors as you exit. If you'd like to participate in the ministry of this church, then please drop in your ties and offerings. It's been great to have you here today. Once again, thanks to the worship team for uh, all that you did to finish the worship uh, message and song this morning. And, uh, go forth having a great Resurrection Sunday. God bless you, you're dismissed.